happy new year to all our friends and colleagues around the globe. We want to thank you for joining us today. My name is Lori Pacheco. I'm an ophthalmic registered nurse. I work with the volunteer faculty team here at Orvis. And with me is Dr. Maria Montero. Dr. Montero is the head of ophthalmology for Orvis's Flying Eye Hospital. And together with, of course, Dr. Kevin Barber, we will be moderating today's live surgeries. And we want this to be interactive. We want you to participate with questions. So we encourage you to please feel free to ask questions through the question and answer button on your screen. Just type in your question and at the end, we will go through as many as we can um, that time allows. Um, welcome, Dr. Barber. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Kevin Barber. Thank you for the introduction, Lori. I'm a refractive cataract surgeon here in Central Florida and uh, I welcome you all to my operating room. Really happy to share with you today just a little bit of my journey as a uh, refractive cataract surgeon. You know, when I finished residency, we did not have toric lenses. We didn't have MIGS procedures. And so those are things, those are skills that I had to learn and had to incorporate into my practice um, uh, after training. And so I'm hoping to share some pearls on that with you guys so that those of you interested in adding these skills uh, to, uh, to your armamentarium, you can do that. So I have three basic objectives for the next hour. I'm gonna present two cases. The first case will be a femtosecond laser assisted surgery where we're gonna place a toric intraocular lens. We're gonna also use a digital marker and intraoperative aberrometry uh, for teaching purposes to help demonstrate some of the pearls in placing toric lenses. The second case will be a manual phaco emulsification. Um, and in that case, we'll be performing a MIGS procedure doing a hook. Uh, goniotomy knife as treatment for moderate glaucoma. The third objective um, is that I'm actually using a 3D visualization system um, for these cases. It's the Ingenuity Heads Up Display System. So that gives us some extra um, perks, so to speak, as far as streaming and teaching. So um, I hope that you guys will appreciate that today. Um, so with that, I'm going to go scrub and, and get started on our first patient, and I'll introduce Dr. Uh, Maria Montero from Mexico, and she'll give you some background information on our first patient this morning. Okay, so our first case is going to be a left eye, and it's going to be a femtosecond uh, assisted cataract surgery with a toric intraocular lens using a digital marker and intraoperative averometry, like Dr. Barber just mentioned. It's a 73-year-old female with myopic astigmatism and a cataract that is classified as um, nuclear 3 plus. The preoperative refraction is minus 5 with plus 3 at 96 for astigmatism and the best corrected vision on that eye is 20 over 60. So for those of us who use um, minus cylinders, it's minus, minus two with minus three for astigmatism at six degrees. The patient desires monovision with a minus 2.25 outcome in this operative eye. The pre-op keratometry is minus three diopters of cylinder at axis 106. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. As you guys can see, we have already applied the femtosecond laser um, application. I do not use the incisions. I prefer still manual made incisions because I can place them exactly where I want them. This is a 1.2 millimeter paracentesis. Now I'm going to fill the anterior chamber with a viscodispersive. You'll notice I'll go all the way across the interior chamber and fill from the most distal part backward. This allows for a complete exchange of aqueous, which will give you the most consistent pressure. And that's important as you create your clear corneal incision. So this is a 2.4 millimeter keratome. I'm going to go right at the limbus. I'm going to engage the stroma. Once I engage the stroma, I'm going to drop the heel of the blade go up two millimeters. I'm then going to lift the heel of the blade, enter into the anterior chamber, drop back down, and go all the way in. You can see the internal lip or the internal incision here is a straight line. That's our goal. If it's a chevron sign or the shape of the keratome, that's not going to seal as well. 
So you're always looking for that internal line to be straight. Now you'll notice here that there's a few tags where the capsular rectus is not possibly not complete here and here. So I'm not going to just grab the capsular rectus. I'm actually going to walk it around just like you normally would in a manual case. Make sure I don't cause any tears in our anterior capsule. Now, if you haven't seen a lot of femtosecond cases, you might notice some unusual uh, signs here. You see these uh, large bubbles. Those are air bubbles created by the femtosecond laser. Those are posterior to the nucleus. So they actually create a pneumodissection, so to speak, which means hydrodissection does not need to be as vigorous. I'm using a chain cannula here to do my hydrodissection. The goal of our hydrodissection is to separate cortex from capsule and to get freely, a freely mobile and rotating lens. I like the chain cannula for that because as you can see, you can easily engage the nucleus to rotate the lens. Kevin, I already have two questions here. On sure. The, um, the first one is, what is the best way to mark the patients? And we had a lot of that, this question beforehand. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, what I prefer is sitting the patient up uh, upright in the pre-op or before they're brought to the operating room, although it can be done in the operating room. And you use a, a, a marker and you're going to make some reference marks at the horizontal meridian. So at axis zero and 180. There's um, applications now for smartphones like Toracam that can help you do this more accurately. Because as you know, when you freehand it, it can be um, uh, not as accurate. Uh, we're not always perfect. Um, so using something like Toracam, uh, uh, there's several applications for smartphones that are out there. And we can talk more about that in just a moment. That was a great question. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're going to go into phaco emulsification. So I'm going to use a modified stop and chop technique. So I'm in my sculpt mode first. I like doing the sculpt because it helps me create some space. Now, because of the femtosecond laser, I don't have to go very deep with my sculpt. I'm gonna go all the way down to the bottom of the, the trench here and use equal pressure on both sides to get a good crack. Now I'll go into my quadrant removal setting. With my technique, I use the second instrument to actually lift the nucleus up into my safety zone. So my goal when I'm teaching FACO is, and doing FACO is to keep my FACO needle in the central safety zone so at the iris plane, and centralized so that I'm less likely to get myself into trouble. So with this technique, I'm trying to keep my phaco needle as stationary as possible. And then I'm gonna use my second instrument to manipulate the nucleus and bring it to where I want it. So we have one half of the nucleus taken out. We're now going to go for the other half. So again, I'll use the same maneuver and just lift the nucleus out of the capsule and up into the anterior chamber and try to fake it in the iris plane. I'm using Another torsional. Question. Sure. Another question that we have here is why did you choose to make the incisions manually rather than with the femtosecond laser? Great question. Great question. So the challenge I've had with femtosecond laser incisions is that sometimes they are placed more anterior. So instead of the incision, for instance, the corneal incision being right here at the limbus, it'll be anterior or more centralized. And that poses some problems. One, that throws off your astigmatic, your surgically induced astigmatism measurement. And two, it just makes the surgery a little more difficult. It's a lot more difficult to get subincisional cortex that way. And it gives you less working space when you're phacoing. So I have found that I can get the incision with my keratome right where I want it um, every time. So because of that inconsistency, that's why I choose uh, to do that. Great question. 
Okay, now we're moving into cortex removal. Cortex removal is the, the coordination of hand movement and foot movement. So I'm going to grab cortex. I'm in foot position zero here. As I move out, I'm gonna grab some cortex with light vacuum and then I'm gonna pull it centrally. And as I pull it centrally, I'm stepping down on the pedal to increase vacuum. And cortex removal is basically repeating that procedure of going from zero vacuum here centrally, light vacuum under the capsule and then pulling centrally while building vacuum. You do not want to keep your, your IA tip stationary underneath the capsule as you might grab the capsule inadvertently. Another question that was asked a lot has to do with choosing the patient. What degree of astigmatism can be corrected with the toric uh, intraocular lenses? What is the degree of the astigmatism that can be corrected? Another great question. Um, so uh, the, the toric lenses that I use are the Alcon lenses and they go from a T3 to a T9, which corrects for one diopter of astigmatism all the way up to four diopters of astigmatism. Okay, now we've had cortex removal here. I have the 1.2 blade. So you can see that I've got um, some ballooning of the conjunctiva here. Now, normally that's not of much concern. However, when we're going to do intraoperative aberrometry, that can cause pooling of fluid here, which can um, affect our measurements. So I just made a small little incision in the conjunctiva there to help reduce that. So now I'm filling the anterior chamber in the capsule with a dispersive or correction, I'm sorry, a cohesive viscoelastic. So this is provisc in this case. I'm now gonna check the pressure with applanation. Great. And when we do intraoperative aberrometry, it's important that we have a moist cornea, that we don't have influence from the, the pressure from the speculum and that there's not excessive fluid. So I'm just gonna take a moment to remove the viscoelastic any of this elastic that could be there, any excess fluid. All right, and now we're gonna to switch to the view for our intraoperative aberrometry. Great view. Excellent, excellent. All right, so I'm lining up um, a couple of parameters here to make sure we have a good view, which we do. Let's go ahead and capture. The intraoperative aberrometry is gonna take 40 measurements in less than a second, so it's very quick. And then it's going to give us our, our readings. So if we look at the, the diagram here, um, the green line is the aphakic refraction. So that's the refraction that I just uh, did. And then the keratometry is the blue line. So you can see there's a slight discrepancy there. Keratometry has almost three diopters and the aphakic refraction has 1.3. Now this is common. This can be due to posterior corneal astigmatism and also can be due to things such as uh, just not getting a good measurement because we have the speculum pressing on the eye and things um, uh, of this nature. Now I have the luxury that I did this patient's first eye and her keratometry was almost the same in both. And the same measurement was achieved in her first eye where we only did a T3. So I'm gonna go with my aphakic refraction here. So in this case, we're going to pick uh, an 18 diopter lens that's gonna get us closest to our target refraction of minus 2.25. And then we're gonna pick a T4. The T4 is aimed to treat 1.5 diopters of astigmatism. And as you can see from the aphakic refraction, 1.31 is what we have. So that therefore T4 will be our most accurate or closest um, toric lens power. So my staff is now uh, preparing that lens now that we've picked it out. Did you have another uh, question, Dr. Montero? Yes, we have, um, we have a lot of questions about how, what do you do if you have a posterior capsule tear during surgery? What would be your approach? 
Um, so if it's a toric case, I assume that question means specifically with, uh, with a toric. Back there. Um, yeah, then I would choose not to put a toric lens in because obviously this is a one piece um, acrylic lens. It's not designed to go into the sulcus. Um, it, it really needs full capsular support. So um, I would choose to abandon and I would go with probably a three piece, assuming I have maybe anterior capsular support, I'd put a three piece lens into the sulcus um, and, and not attempts to put a toric lens in. And that's a very important point. We're always, you know, aim for, you know, our goal is to, to correct the astigmatism, but if the case does not allow us to safely do that, then we won't. All right, so now we're gonna switch. Um, Lawrence, if you could highlight the, uh, the iPad view. Um, what I would like to show you guys is the overlay. So are you guys able to see that overlay? It's a green line and a red line mm -hmm. there over the eye. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so these are the digital markers. So the green line is the digital marker showing me the preoperative axis yeah, of astigmatism. And then the red line is the, um, is the aura. And so as you can see, they're lined up very nicely. So that's how I'm going to line up the axis of a toric lens. Now, I fully realize and understand that most surgeons don't have the luxury of digital markers or, or aberrometers in their operating room. So what you would do at this point, um, if you were doing this manually, is you would have here at zero and 180, you would have your marks. You would use something like a Mendez ring that gives you the full axis uh, markings around the limbus. And then you would line your toric lens up that way. A little tip as we see that lens unfolding. Um, if you have a blanket warmer, you could actually put the lens in the blanket warmer prior to the case. It softens it up a little bit and makes it a little easier to load and to open up. That's a great tip because sometimes those lenses take a, a while to, to <laughs> unfold, which and is, those... as you know, and patient surgeons don't like that. Okay, <laughs> Lawrence, could you switch back to the microscope view now? Okay, so now I, for my cases, I do trimoxy. So this is a compounded formula of triamcinolone and moxifloxacin. I inject it through the zonules into the anterior vitreous. My patients do not take post-operative eye drops because the antibiotic and the steroid are placed in the eye. And because they're placed in the vitreous, there's a depot effect of slow release um, of about six weeks. It offers better protection against endophthalmitis. And in 95% of my patients, there's no rebound inflammation that requires topical steroid treatment. So it's a really um, good way of providing the medications that patients need postoperatively. So now I'm just removing the viscoelastic and being sure to go around the angle in a light colored iris like this. Sometimes little pieces of lens material can hide. So it's good to go around and do that. I'm now going to seal my incisions and then I'll, I'll reposition my IOL in the last step. So when I hydrate, I'm hydrating that internal wound there. That's what's gonna give me the best seal. Come over to my para. Um, I have a question here. Um, which is the risk of increased intraocular pressure due to the GMC alone? Yeah, it's a great question, great question. So now let me be very clear. I do not advocate that surgeons compound these medications in their clinic or in their ORs and inject them into the eye. This is purchased from Imprimis Pharmaceuticals, which does exceptional quality control. And as part of that quality control, there's been exceptional titration of the concentration of triamcinolone, where they do some proprietary uh, modifications to the medication. And that's been, when we first started using this, probably six or seven years ago, there were pressure spikes in about 20% of patients. Now we've titrated the dose and the volume down to where there's less than 5% of patients that would have a, um, an IOP steroid response from the trimoxy. So I do not do trimoxy in patients with advanced glaucoma. Um, however, um, I do feel 
that it's better for pretty much every other patient and uh, you use that accordingly. But that's a, that's a great question. And certainly what we were thinking about when we first started using this. Would, you do, a, would you do a second capture for any, say maybe post-refractive patients? Or when would you choose to maybe do a, a, a second capture before you closed up? Yeah, great question. So um, when, I first, when we first had Aura, many of us did that. So what, um, what Lori's referring to is after I put the lens in, we can do a phacic refraction. Um, and check to see how much residual astigmatism is there. The problem is that the pressure has to be perfect again. Um, and so <clears throat> most of us realized that we did not get any additional information. Now, occasionally we can do that if we had a very challenging case where we really were not sure if we used the right power or the right access because the measurements were um, not very reliable. In those cases, we could, but I, I think what's happened naturally is that we're just selecting those patients out. So for instance, if I have a patient whose preoperative keratometry readings don't make a lot of sense, they're not consistent, I'm just simply not going to offer a toric to that patient because I don't have a high level of confidence that I'm going to hit the refractive target. So um, I think just by natural selection, we've stopped doing that because it would take more time than it was really um, really work, but great question. So we have about five minutes here while my staff turns over and gets the, the second patient ready. So happy to, uh, uh, to field a few more questions. Kevin, a lot of questions are about the, uh, the intraocular lens calculations. If you just do it with intraoperatively with the aura or if you can do it before especially for our friends that don't have access to an aura for example how would you do this great question so just so you know the intraoperative aberometer requires preoperative measurements that is a large part of how the aberometer works so you cannot abandon preoperative measurements. That's still the biggest part of this. So there, I think there's a misconception that intraoperative aberometry replaces our biometry. It does not. It's just an extra tool that helps us take one more step towards uh, you know, the holy grail or, or, or perfection of, of Plano. You know? so, um, so we still do biometry the same way. I personally will measure Ks, the keratometry in three ways. My lens star or my biometer does it. Um, I use a topographer and then I'll use one other form, whether it's an auto keratometer. In my case, it's the digital marker, the Varion, but I've used multiple things throughout my career. So that way I have three K measurements. So I'm comparing the magnitude of astigmatism and the axis of astigmatism um, in three different ways. And I want those to line up. I want those to be similar. And then I'm I go with my lens star readings and that's what we plug into the aura. And then I'm still using my same formulas and I use two, I'll use a holiday two formula and I'll use a Barrett universal formula because again, I like to have two different formulas. And sometimes for instance, in this case, Barrett recommended a 17.5, holiday two recommended uh, an 18. Well, then I let aura Kind of be my my decision maker so again there's not one piece of technology or one modality that um, allows us to turn our brains off as surgeons and we have to use all of this information um, uh, appropriately and in its place dr Faber, what degree of rotation would you have to bring a patient back to reposition the lens fantastic question um, so i don't think there's a number I think that that's more of a, um, of a question, you know, with patient satisfaction. So sometimes we get fixated on, well, gosh, there's a half a diopter of residual astigmatism after my toric Im implant. Does that mean that I failed my patient? Not necessarily. The patient's 20, 25 or 20, 30, they might be perfectly happy. This patient is a great example on the first eye, on the distance eye, she's 20, 25, and she's minus a quarter plus a half plus 0.5. So she has a half a diopter of residual astigmatism. However, she's completely happy. So do I need to worry about that residual astigmatism? Absolutely not. Now there's a great um, tool. It's called astigmatismfix.com. It was created by John Burdall. So if you have a toric patient 
and they're not seeing as well, and they do have weird astigmatism afterward that doesn't make sense to you, you can go to that website. It's free, astigmatismfix.com. You can plug in all of the information and it will tell you if rotating the lens would help. And it'll tell you how much you need to rotate the lens. And so I will use that. So if I have a patient who comes back with an, uh, a level of astigmatism that I was not anticipating, that's where I go to. I go to astigmatismfix.com. I will tell you, um, in putting in thousands of toric lenses, I've had to go back and rotate less than five. That doesn't happen very commonly, which is nice. What would be more commonly is actually getting the spherical power wrong um, more than the, the toric axis. If you're placing your incision in the same axis as the astigmatism, does that change your procedure? You could flatten it. Um, would you change the diopter of astigmatism you're gonna put in the lens? Would you change your incision? What would you do if that came up? Yeah, great question. So I think what, um, what you're getting at is, is surgically induced astigmatism. Mm -hmm. So as, we, as you guys know, as we make an incision in the cornea uh, with the keratome, that's going to slightly change the astigmatism. So how do we address that? So um, I'm lucky in that my digital marker takes care of that for me. But where each surgeon should start is determining your own surgically induced astigmatism. And it's different for each surgeon based on where you make your incisions, what type of keratome or the size of your incisions, the, the style of your incisions, all of those factors will, will come into play. So if you go to ASCRS.org, to the ASCRS website, they have on there a free um, spreadsheet that any surgeon can download and use. And it shows you exactly how to calculate your surgically induced astigmatism. So it, I encourage each surgeon who's going to adopt um, uh, toric lenses to do that. In my case, it's, a, it's about 0.25, so uh, a small amount. And I think that comfort trumps astigmatism. So what I mean by that is that I always wanna make my, my main incision temporarily where I'm comfortable. If I bring it up, um, you know, into an uncomfortable position, more, uh, more superior or more inferior, just to treat astigmatism, um, it's more likely that I'm going to struggle in that case and possibly cause a complication. So I would rather do the math and then use a toric planner that tells me how to adjust the axis of the toric lens to accommodate or to account for my surgically induced astigmatism. Hi, Dr. Barber. It's Antonio here. There's a couple of questions about the injection of transinolone and the antibiotic at the end. Is there any risk of vitreous loss? Would you ex have you experienced any IOL rotation after injecting? Um, any vitreous loss? No. Um, however, um, there is a learning curve to doing transonular injections. So during the learning curve, could you cause a zonular dehiscence? Um, could you inadvertently inject it through the capsule and cause a capsular rupture? Yes, you could. So I don't advocate doing transonular injections um, unless, you're, unless you have the, the opportunity to be trained on that because it's, although it's simple, it does require some training. Um, the other modality is you can do a pars plana injection and sometimes that's a little safer. Um, because all of my cases are topical, I don't use the pars plana because patients will feel that sometimes. But especially if, you're, if your patients are blocked, then you can just measure back, uh, you know, three millimeters from the limbus and put on a 27 gauge needle and you can inject the trimoxy that way to avoid the risk of, um, of damaging the zonules or the capsule. Do you place the intraocular lens exactly on where the astigmatism axis is, or do you place it with a slight deviation before the axis, as some surgeons do? Yeah, great question. So um, when you place the lens in, um, oftentimes you can leave it about five degrees counterclockwise to your intended axis, because the lens, as you remove the viscoelastic, might rotate a little bit. 
And so you can always spin the lens clockwise very easily, but a little more difficult to go backwards. Sometimes you have to go all the way back around. So uh, I think it's a great technique and a great idea to leave the toric lens about five to 10 degrees counterclockwise or shy of your intended axis. Take your viscoelastic out. And then as you're sealing your incisions, you can use your DSS cannula to go nudge the lens that last five degrees to get it right on axis. So fantastic question. And yes, I, I advocate that um, that technique. It just makes, makes things easier because if you have to go and spin that lens, you know, 340 degrees because it rotated too much, that's just unnecessary. Without viscoelastic in the bag, that's, you know, that can be dangerous. So I think that's a great technique. Mm -hmm. that, that was another question. If you remove the viscoelastic from the posterior surface of the lens. So I did not on, on this case because I, w with the ingenuity, the visualization is so good, I can actually see the viscoelastic. But uh, you know, earlier in my career with traditional microscopes, we could not see it. So I would always go under to get it just in case because if you leave um, a deposit of the viscoelastic there, that can cause rotation to the lens or it can also cause anterior displacement, which would cause a myopic shift or outcome as well. And so it's always better to take it out. In this case, I did not simply because I saw it come out. So I didn't need to take the additional time or risk. But normally I would say yes, if you're not sure. Um, and that's a very easy step. Just nudge the lens down, slip your IA tip underneath it. Make sure your IA port is facing up towards you, not to the side where it can grab the capsule and then do very slow uh, build of your vacuum to remove that viscoelastic. If you're using a cohesive, it should all come out quite easily. Our second patient's ready. So I'll go ahead and uh, scrub and, and get ready. And then, and then uh, Dr. Montero can give us just a little description on what we're, what we're getting into here. Before we start the second case, just a, um, a tip for everyone when you're using interoperative aberrometry, is your IOL inventory. Um, you have to have a really good inventory of IOL because that machine can tell you, um, you could be going three diopters up. Rule of thumb usually for me is to order th three diopters up and three diopters down and maybe like half diopter increments um, to have on inventory because the machine could change the diopter stigmatism on you as well. So you could go from maybe a, a T3 um, to say a T4. Um, it can do that as well. So just make sure you have a good supply of inventory in your OR. And with that, also be sure when you, you could have up to 20 IOLs in your OR on standby that you could use. So with that, also double check and triple check what you're putting in the eye because you do increase the risk of the wrong IOL when you have that many IOLs in your OR. Lori, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, before interoperative ab aberrometry, I would um, pick my lens preoperatively and we had one lens in the OR and that's the lens that was going in. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, about 30% of the time, uh, my toric IOL choice will be changed by aberrometry, not by much, just as you mentioned, it'll go from a T3 to a T4 or an 18 diopter to a, you know, 18.5 diopter. Um, but, uh, you know, those little incremental changes are what refractive cataract surgery is all about. You know, we're trying to get the, those last remnants of astigmatism and, and spherical uh, correction reduced as much as possible. But that is a great point. There's a little more um, hassle in the OR uh, because you, you do have to have a, a big pile of lenses available mm -hmm. instead, of, yeah. um, instead of just one. Okay, okay, so what you'll notice um, is that this, this is our, our, our MIGS patient. This will be a, a manual surgery. And there's a, somewhat of a small pupil. This patient does take Tamsulosin. So we will most likely use a Malugan ring here. Um, you know, maybe I could do this case without a ring. Um, but what I've noticed is that the pupil never gets bigger when you do a case, it only gets smaller. So if even if you're in question um, about should I treat, you know, should I deal with a small pupil, the answer oftentimes should be yes. So I'm going to try a little epinephrine and lidocaine intracameral here to see if it gives us any more um, dilation. And of course, we can use our dispersive viscoelastic here. 
patient does have moderate glaucoma. He's taking two, uh, two drops. His pressure has been in the low twenties on two drops. So he's an ideal NIGS, NIGS candidate. Okay, so I've done my complete viscoelastic fill here. Again, same technique for making the primary incision. When you have a, a potential floppy iris, you might consider making your corneal incision length a little longer just to help prevent iris prolapse. All right, so this is a Malugan ring. I use my second instrument to help it get through the primary incision. Some of you might say, ah, oh, you don't really need a ring, and that might be true. But again, I have the luxury of knowing that I needed one for his first eye. So I got all four eyelets on the iris during implantation. That doesn't always happen. So sometimes you might just get one and then you go in with your second instrument to position the others. You just wanna be careful with the anterior capsule that you try not to tear or, or damage the anterior capsule. Now we'll make a manual capsular exit. So I start centrally, I puncture through the capsule and then I move out peripherally and lift up. As I lift up, it creates this flap it's now very easy to grab. I'll now walk it around. Taking my time to re-grab, I'll usually re-grab three times my average capsule rectus. However, if I need to grab more, I will. So I'll grab here. And again, walking around, striving for approximately a five millimeter capsule rectus. And so the audience knows he is sitting superior. That's just one of the questions that comes up. So he is sitting superior. That's right. Thank you. All right. Hydro dissection here with the chain cannula. So the chain cannula also allows you to hydro dissect sub incisionally, which is nice because the sub incisional cortex is what gives us our most trouble sometimes. So being able to start your hydro dissection fluid wave there. Uh, sometimes has benefit. And what I just demonstrated there is a little push pull technique. So sometimes if the lens won't rotate, you can lightly push it to try to separate any adhesions between the cortex and the capsule. All right, now we'll go into Fake emulsification. So I always check my sleeve and my irrigation before I go in. There we go. I want about a millimeter of metal showing on my FACO tip, and I want the irrigation ports 90 degrees away from my bevel. Okay, so I'll clear out some working space here to remove a little of the viscoelastic. Here, if you go right into phacoing viscoelastic, you can cause occlusion in your phaco needle. And I'll create my central groove here. For a good crack, we're gonna go all the way down to the bottom of the groove and apply equal pressure on both sides. Using the same technique, I'm going to elevate First nucleus there. Should be able to see the FACO parameters there. So with quadrant removal, higher flow, higher aspiration, higher vacuum. And we're going to use burst FACO energy, not constant FACO energy as we do with skull. I'm using mostly torsional. So I'm using a Centurion machine made by Alcon, which has torsional capabilities, which has some safety profiles compared to longitudinal. Okay, so now I'll see if I can rotate this nucleus. 
around to the other side of the capsule. So it's directly across from my tape of the needle. And then I can lift it up easily, placing it in the best position. And just eating the nucleus as it comes to the phaco tip. All right, now I have a fairly um, large epinuclear plate. So I'll go into my epinuclear setting. I don't always do this. So very little phaco power, much lower vacuum. So things move slower. I'm still gonna try to stay as central as possible. And I can use my second instrument again to help tease some of the epinucleus away from the capsule into my central safety zone. In that case, if it's not coming, I'm not gonna go after it with my phaco needle right now. I don't think it's safe to be going out underneath your capsule with your phaco needle. So I'll just switch to my irrigation aspiration. And try to take the epinucleus out that way. Cortex. Grabbing the cortex, it helps bring the epinucleus with it oftentimes. Whereas when you grab the epinucleus, sometimes it doesn't all want to come at once. And using the same technique of stripping the cortex towards the center, being careful not to apply too much vacuum when I'm underneath the cup, so. We have a question about your second instrument. What, what is it? What's the name of it? Great question. It's a straight Connor wand. So the Connor wand is very capsular friendly because there's a polished spherical ball at the end. Um, and so that's why I feel comfortable with my technique using it beneath the nucleus going underneath the nucleus to um, lift it up. Um, obviously you'd never try that with a, with a horizontal or vertical chopper that those um, you know, have sharp edges that you wouldn't want to get you know, close to the capsule. So especially for beginning cataract surgeons, uh, the Connor wand's a great instrument because it is so capsular friendly. Um, certainly there's a, a learning curve of learning how to use a second instrument using your non-dominant hand um, inside the eye. You can see there's a little bit of a stubborn epinucleus. So I'm going in between the epinucleus and the capsule and want to just lift up and then try to vacuum, apply vacuum once I'm up into the anterior chamber. Again, protecting my, my capsule. Okay, fantastic. I also come off of my irrigation before coming out of the eye when I have a small pupil or a floppy iris and that'll help keep the iris from prolapsing through. The only reason the iris will prolapse through your wound is if you create a pressure gradient. If the pressure is higher in the eye than it is in the atmosphere, that's when the iris wants to come out. So by coming off of your irrigation before you bring your your instruments out of the eye, that's um, a really good practice. All right, so this is a monofocal lens. It's, in, it's a preloaded lens. So it's a plunger type injector, not a dial. So I'm gonna inject that right into the capsule there. I'm using my second instrument to help guide it right into place. Position it centrally, all right. So now we'll go ahead and switch to uh, the mix procedure. So um, Lawrence, if you wouldn't mind spotlighting the iPad view again, I would just like to show um, how we do that. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rotate the microscope approximately 30 degrees towards the surgeon. And then I'm going to take the patient's head and I'm gonna rotate 
that approximately 30 degrees away from the surgeon. And then I will refocus my, my microscope here. So by 30 degrees with the microscope towards the surgeon, the patient's head 30 degrees away, that should give us um, a great gonioscopic view. So the next thing I'm gonna do is fill the anterior chamber with a little more viscoelastic, just to open up that angle to give us the best view possible. I then will put viscoelastic actually on the gonio prism itself, on the bottom of the gonio prism, especially if viscoelastic is a premium and you don't have a lot of it, you'll use less if you put it on the gonio prism. All right, now we can, Lawrence, go back to the microscope view. This is the Kahook dual blade. This is the new version called the Glide. I'll put that through my primary incision. I'll then place my gonio lens on the eye. Real important not to press down with the gonio lens. Now you can see the spots of blood. That clearly del delineates where Schlund's canal is. So I'm gonna engage regular mesh work right there. And I'm gonna progress forward. And then I'm gonna come back this way. So this is what's called an outside in technique. You're gonna go the outside on both directions. And then you're gonna to try to bring, meet them in the middle here. There's not a very pigmented trabecular mesh work. It's a little harder to see. Tom, can I have you look at your left shoulder for me? That's great. So sometimes asking the patient to position, I'm just doing this to show, try to show a little bit better view of the angle. Here we go. So you can see we've made a trough here and here. And then oftentimes you'll have a tag of trabecular meshwork and we'll try to amputate that. And oftentimes you'll have reflux of blood Shum's canal into the anterior chamber, and that's perfectly fine. Okay, so as you can see, fairly simple. We're aiming to do two to four clock hours. So now I'll position the patient back into the neutral stance here so that we can finish, finish the case. I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit. So again, trying to get about two to four clock hours uh, of treatment of removing that trabecular mesh work. So now I'll go ahead and place my trimoxy. This patient has a mild to moderate glaucoma, so I'm not terribly worried about, um, you know, an IOP spike. His optic nerve is 0 0.65 cup to disc. So again, going through the zonules, injecting 0.15 milliliters of the trimoxy. And now I will remove the Cayugan ring. I wait to do that last because it's important when you're doing the trimoxy injection to visualize your capsular edge. So that's why I'm waiting until the very end here to take out my ring. So I'll just disinsert each of the four eyelets from the iris. You certainly can use the injector to remove, or you can pull it out that way. I would re probably recommend using the injector to remove it uh, when you're learning, if you don't have a lot of experience with the Malugan ring, because that is a little easier and safer. Now I'll go oh, to my viscoelastic disco setting, which just has higher flow and vacuum. I'm going to remove all of the viscoelastic. We'll nudge underneath the lens, lift it up, lightly vacuum to get the viscoelastic out from underneath the lens, and then reposition the IOL centrally. And again, coming off of irrigation as I come out, and you see the iris stays inside the eye nicely not trying to prolapse through our incision. So I'm gonna, again, hydrate the primary incision here. Put 
then hydrate my paracentesis, reposition the limbs, and we will be finished. I have a little soft, check a little more, CSS. I like that. If you get hemorrhaging from doing any mix procedure and it's a lot, you can actually um, irrigate it out and then you can actually increase the intracular pressure for a few moments and that will tampon on the bleeding. Obviously you don't want to do that for too long, but that's just a trick. You can if you do have more bleeding than, than you like. Okay, that concludes um, our, our psychic kicks. There's a lot of questions on why did you use it on this specific case where it seemed like the dilation was so-so? Great question. And I think that that's, um, I think that that's a question that I have to ask myself often because you have cases like this where a patient takes a medication that's known to cause floppy iris. Um, and the dilation is moderate. So could I have done that case without a Malugan ring? Probably. However, I had done his other eye already and I had trouble with the iris and I ended up using a Malugan ring. And I would rather, I feel very comfortable putting a Malugan ring in. And I think that that's easier, especially if I'm going to be working in the angle doing uh, more than just a simple FACO. We're also, we're gonna be in the eye longer. And as you know, the longer you're in the eye, the more the pupil can constrict. So in that case, it was questionable, but I decided to make it easier on myself, just holding the pupil back. Um, I think if I was not using that case for the streaming event, I might have tried it without, but that's a question that um, each surgeon always has to, to make at that time. And I would say, especially earlier on in your career, if you have access to the rings, I would use them because it makes the case go so much easier. It keeps your stress and your anxiety level down and allows you to perform the, the surgery well. Um, when you don't use a ring, if that pupil comes down, you're more likely to have capsular rupture or capsular problems. You're more likely to leave lens material in the eye. A host of complications can occur with a small pupil, as we all know. Would you ever remove it before the MIGS procedure? or you yeah. removed it after. Is there a reason why you did it after and not before? Yeah, absolutely. So you can, the only reason I did it um, afterwards is because I needed to put my trimoxy in. And putting trimoxy in with a small pupil is very difficult because if you can't see your anterior capsule edge, you could inject the trimoxy right into the capsule or even rupture the capsule. So that's why in my particular technique, when I use trimoxy, I would be more inclined to leave it in till the end. If you're not doing trimoxy, absolutely. I think it's perfectly fine to take it out at the end or after you put the lens implant in. And that um, might even make your, your mix procedure go a little easier. So that's perfectly reasonable. Going back to your first procedure, Dr. Barber, one of the questions is, you know, what would be your next step if the patient's just not happy, not satisfied with their vision? What would you do next? Yeah, with the toric lens. So, um, you know, the dissatisfied premium patient is um, kind of a, a whole education in, in and of itself. Um, and part of that's psychology <laughs> and, and part of that's medicine. And so uh, as far as the medicine part of it, I think you take the objective information. The first thing that I've learned that will make a refractive patient unhappy is if they have refractive error. So if they come out a minus one, plus one, and you're, you, know, you were aiming for, uh, for Plano, they're probably not gonna be happy. So you have to have ways of dealing with that. Um, if it's an axis issue, you can rotate the lens. If it's a spherical issue, you can exchange the lens. That's you know, a, a skill that each cataract surgeon should eventually become comfortable with um, to correct the, the refractive error. You can um, uh, you know, do laser correction. Uh, you, know, you can do things like PRK, that would be very common. Um, not everybody has access to that. I don't have to use that you know, terribly often because we try as hard as we can to be accurate you know, with, our, with our measurements and our IOL selection. Um, and then the other part to that is just preoperative counseling. So when I tell patients who are going to receive a toric lens, I give them, I say, hey, I get, I get you to 
2030 vision or better 84% of the time. If I can get you to 2030 or better, you're probably not going to wear glasses and you're probably going to be really happy with your vision. But there's a 16% chance that um, we'll be off a little bit. And so patients, if they understand that up front, and please don't use my numbers, you need to use your own, you know, your own numbers as a surgeon. But I think part of treating post-operative refractive error is the pre-operative counseling that you give them. And so making sure they understand that this is not perfect and we don't always have a hundred percent chance of getting, of reducing their dependence on glasses. Excellent. Uh, what other questions do we have? Does, it, uh, does your trimoxy affect the patient's vision the next day? It does, yeah. So it, it, it causes a lot of, as you know, it's very cloudy. It takes about three days to dissolve. So for the first three days, patients have large floaters, usually in the superior, because I inject it inferior, so they perceive it superior. So they'll call it tree branches is what they usually call, call it, and it's uh, large floaters that last for three days um, in their superior vision. And we consent them for that and warn our patients of that so that they're expecting it. And there's another one here. If you could comment on the difference between this blade, this Tehuk dual blade, and the original one, are there any changes? So the one I just used is the newest one. It's called the Glide, um, and this is only my third time actually using it. And so they made a, a tighter taper. So um, it the the dual blade is still there, but it's designed to be more efficient to cut the trabecular meshwork more efficiently. And I do believe that's true. As you could, as you just saw with the case, there's no resistance. As we, I remember when I first started doing hook blades, as I would rotate the hook in the trabecular meshwork, the whole eye would rotate because there was resistance. Part of that's technique. And part of that, I think was the first generation of the, of the, of the blade. But now there's no resistance. It just, uh, you know, it's like cutting butter. It's so, um, uh, so efficient. So, uh, I'm excited that, that uh, New World Medical is rolling out an improvement on an already great, uh, great product. And I think that the hook blade for goniotomy is something that can be used globally. You know, it's fairly low cost compared to lots of other MIGS, you know, procedures, and it works really well. Uh, and as you saw, skill-wise, technically, it's, it's something that's easy, uh, I think, for surgeons to add to their, uh, to their skill set. Would you ever consider using phenylephrine in this case, intercambo phenylephrine? I did. Yep, I injected that. Um, yep. I did it quickly, so you might have might have missed that. But I did. I had a uh, a combination of, of lidocaine and uh, phenylephrine, phenylephrine that was injected to yeah to try to help with uh, um, with it. what I've noticed is that'll help initially. But if you're going to be in the eye longer than about five or six minutes, it starts to wear off, and the pupil slowly starts coming down. So knowing that this was going to be a slightly longer procedure with MIGS, um, again, was why I chose to go with a ring okay. on that. But absolutely, if you don't have access to a ring, um, but you do have phenylephrine or, or dilating agent, then that's, uh, that's a no-brainer. You definitely should use that. Do you ever have a chance of damaging the iris muscles using an Eugen ring? I think so. Uh, yeah. Early on in my career, I actually disinserted an iris root by just trying to remove the ring. So certainly there's a, a skill in, in um, learning. So I, I think watching videos, trying to get into a wet lab. Uh, I know we have uh, wet lab eyes now that allow for pupil you know, rings so you can really practice with the iris manipulation. So there's certainly some risk involved, but I would say that overall that risk is probably lower than trying to do a difficult case with a small pupil. Mm -hmm. When you can't see what you're doing, you're gonna run into trouble a high percentage of the time. And another question is, what is your opinion about multifocal toric lenses? Yeah, multifocal toric lenses, um, that's a whole Pandora's box with multifocal, but I say having the toric um, capacity is great because early on before we had toric, versions of multifocals, the patients that I had that were unhappy were usually because they had residual astigmatism. And um, so now that we can treat that and get them closer to Plano, we have happier patients and it opens the, the door for more patients to be candidates for multifocal lenses. It used to be if they had 
like our first patient this morning at three diopters of corneal astigmatism, we would never offer a multifocal to that patient. But now we can because we have toric multifocals that can do that. So you use the same principles in toric implantation as you do with a monofocal toric, but then you add on the discussions with the patient about multifocal technology. Excellent, thank you. And what is your expectation of the KDV effect on the intraocular pressure for this patient? Yeah, great question. So um, I will say that all MIGs, in my experience, um, is ultimately good and ultimately helps. I think we send a lot fewer patients on to more invasive glaucoma procedures like tubes and trabeculectomies because we're able to do a better job controlling the pressure with MIGs. Um, and, but I will say that it can be inconsistent. So I do have patients that get a minimal response to a MIGS procedure and they do have to go on to other treatments. Um, but I would say um, in my experience, probably two thirds of them will um, either have a reduction in the drops that they use or they'll stay on the same drops, but we have a reduction in their intraocular pressure that's uh, significant. I would say, you know, I haven't done a study on my own patients, but I would say observationally, I'll see a, a two to four point pressure reduction um, on my patients who get uh, a, a mixed procedure. So it's not the profound drops that you get with more advanced glaucoma procedures. But if you use MIGs earlier on during cataract surgery, and you can lower that pressure a smaller percentage earlier on in that patient's journey, oftentimes they never have to go on to more invasive care later in their life. So that's how I think about the application of MIGs. How are you doing on time, Dr. Barra? Are you good with a few more questions? Yeah, I think we've got maybe two or three more minutes. So let's okay. uh, try to grab a couple more. All right, so another question was, what you, what's your experience for refractive surprises afterwards? Um, adding on an IUL um, or a patient, you know, with a monofocal IUL and you wanna put it in the sulcus, you wanna put a monofocal IUL in the sulcus, like what do you do with refractive surprises? Um, so I, I assume that question means um, you have a surgical plan maybe to put in uh, a lens in the bag and maybe you have a capsular tear and now you're putting the lens in the sulcus. Yeah. So the first thing is you can make an, a, the adjustment in the IOL power, right? So if you know the A constant of the lens um, that you were going to use and say my in the bag lens was a 118.4, but now I'm going to switch to a three piece lens and it has a different A constant, you can do the simple addition or subtraction. Um, to adjust the IOL power. So it's usually gonna be a half a diopter uh, of adjustment. However, when you capture, if you're gonna take a, if you have a complete anterior capsule and only the posterior capsule has been violated, then you can take the three piece lens and capture it in the optic so that the lens itself is actually posterior to the anterior capsule. And then the haptics are in the, sulcus. When you do that technique, there's minimal change to the effective lens position. So the only change you're making to your IOL power would be based on a difference in the A constant. Okay. So I'll give you an example. I had a patient that I was uh, a few years ago, I was supposed to do a toric. They, they needed, they had about two diopters of astigmatism. I had a posterior capsular tear. I couldn't put the toric lens in. So I made the, the math adjustment there in the OR. I put a, a three-piece lens in the, in the sulcus. I captured the optic. And then I made arcuate incisions on the cornea postoperatively in clinic to treat the astigmatism. And I got the patient not all the way to Plano, but pretty close. And ultimately, the patient was happy. So just because you have a complication in a toric case doesn't mean you, you know, have lost all hope. You can still... Um, still get really good refractive outcomes. You just need to have several different tools uh, to do that. Did, did that answer your question? I want to make sure I understood that question. Uh, yes, that was a question that came up on the, uh, on the chat, but that sounds like you, you captured it. Thank you. Great. Um, Maybe one, one more question before they have my next patient ready. Sure. Um, between the topo, the biometer, the keratometer, which one is your first choice to enter in the biometry formulas? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I, I, I don't know that there's a hard and fast rule um, across the board. Um, I think that takes evaluation from each surgeon. 
because that there, there's factors involved with your technicians taking the test, um, how reliable the test is. So for instance, my digital marker is very finicky. So I don't trust the Ks from my digital marker as much as I do for my LensStar because the LensStar takes the Ks in a more reproducible way and it does it faster. So if it does it faster, we're more likely to get accurate measurements, right? Because the patient's not moving and blinking and that kind of thing. So personally, I go with my LensStar Ks and I'm using my topographer more to, um, to demonstrate that there's symmetric uh, astigmatism and there's not uh, stranger or other forms of astigmatisms, which would be a, to a whole nother, you know, a whole nother topic. But so in my case, I use my lens star case or my biometer case, and that's what I go with. And that's what I plug into the aura. However, um, I wouldn't say that that's the blanket truth for, you know, for all surgeons. I think that that has to be individually um, analyzed. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think we'll stop here. Okay, thank you guys. It was, uh, it was a real pleasure. I hope that this was helpful for those of you uh, in the audience and I hope you all enjoy your, your morning, afternoon or evening, whatever it may be. Thank you thank so much. You.